Okay, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Much better. Thank you. Um, first of all, for those of you who were not in class on Monday for any reason, let me introduce myself to everyone else, still me. Okay, I'm Dr. Joseph Chen. Uh, my email address is chenjk at purdue.edu. And make sure you visit the course webpage, mass.purdue.edu slash MA162 to get the, to look at all the relevant information you need to know. My office hours are officially Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 to 11 a.m. Although today I need to cut it short a little bit by about 10.30 a.m. Um, but if you can find me in my office with my door open, I'll be very happy to talk to you anytime I'm in there. Okay, the second thing I want to talk about is the online, the lecture recording. So if you go to the course webpage, there is a set of instructions that you need to follow to access an online lecture recording. So by a show of hands, how many people have tried to do that? Hands up. Okay, and how many people have tried but are having trouble getting the lecture? There are two common um, problems we've noticed so far. The first one is a, an easy one to fix. The first one is when you get in there and you click on the lecture recording ALP thing, and then it says a new page has been launched, but nothing happens. That, what happens there is that your pop-up blocker in your browser blocks a new page from showing up. So make sure you add, once you get to the blackboard, open up the new page, Disable your pop-up blocker in your browser. Google how to do that if you don't know how to do that. And uh, at least temporarily disable that. That'll fix that problem. The second one uh, will give you some kind of error message talking about permission. That is something we're investigating and we hope to have that fixed soon. How many people have seen, seen the error message? We have a representative from SI, this is Jimmy Dixon. Um, he will tell us a little bit more about supplemental instruction. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me all right?
Thank you, Jimmy. And he got applause. I, I didn't get any. <laughs> so, consider yourself lucky. Um, by the way, Jimmy and I will meet every week to talk about what he does during his SI session, um, what I'm going to be doing in the upcoming week, and things like that. If you want to say something but you don't feel comfortable telling me directly or emailing me, feel free to tell Jimmy, and he'll pass that message on to me anonymously. Um, so that's another good resource in going to SI. All right, so today we're going to finish up section 12.2. Oh, by the way, until we totally fix the uh, lecture recording problem with accessing the lecture recording problem, I'm going to continue sending out the, the direct link to the recording when it becomes available, and also my lecture notes by email after class um, until that problem is fixed. So expect to see that some shortly after class today. So imagine we have two points on our two-dimensional coordinate axis. Let's say the point is at, first one is at A, which is 1, 1. And we'll have another one, B. Um, let's say it's uh, 4, 3. What we can do here is to find a vector that goes from A to B. There's a couple ways to write that. If I write A, B with an arrow over that, this means that find me a vector that takes me from A to B. Okay. And we'll write this in the component form. And how we do that is we need to figure out how many x units I need to move to go from A to B, and then how many y units I need to move to go from A to B. For this one, it's pretty straightforward. We can see I need to move three units to the right. So we write with these triangular brackets. The first component is the x component you need to move. In this case, three. And then the second one is the y component you need to gain or lose to get to the new point. In this case, a two. Okay? So we call this the component. These are the components. of the vector. For three-dimensional or four-dimensional or five-dimensional, the idea is exactly the same. You find out how many of each x, y, z, or whatever else you need to move in order to get to the, the new, new point. Something to keep in mind, though, if I tell you that a vector a is 3, 2, That means any vector, this can represent any vector with the same direction and magnitude. In other words, the starting point of this vector is completely irrelevant. When we talk about a vector, we don't really talk about the starting point. So 
for example, that vector could be A. But another vector with the same length and the same direction, this is also the same vector A, or, or this guy right here, A. Okay? A vector only tells us the, how long it is and in what direction it is pointing. It says nothing about where it is coming from. So just be aware of that. If you have two points, you can find a vector going from one to another. But that same vector you just written down could represent any of these other vectors with the same direction and the same um, magnitude. Does that make sense? Okay. So to recap what we just said, if you have two points, A and B, and you want to find a vector that points from A to B and has the right magnitude, then you just simply take the difference in the X, the difference in the Y, and the difference in the Z. Right? So B is where you want to end up. So you take the X, Y, Z of B, subtracting away A where you are starting from. B, A is the same vector but points in the opposite direction, right? So same idea here. We want to end up on A, and A has an X number of X1, started from B as an X number of X2. Same thing with the Y numbers. And if you have higher dimensions, then the same thing applies. You have just more, more numbers to deal with. So A, A, B might look like that, and a is going to look just like that, pointing in the exactly the wrong, the, the opposite direction. Okay, so now we have the component form of vectors. We can start adding and subtracting them using numbers. We'll use two-dimensional ones just for simplicity and for, for the fact that it's easy to draw. Okay? So here's A minus 2, 6. Here's B. Oops, sorry. I want the two vectors. So here's my vector A minus 2, 6. And my vector B. 6 minus 1. And suppose we're looking for what happens when you add A and B together. And we'll do this in two ways. First, graphically, like we saw in class on Monday, and also by doing components. And then we'll compare the two results. So here's my vector A, minus 2. So mean, this means that it goes to the left 2 units and goes upward 6 units. 
Again, vector tells you nothing about where it is starting. So for simplicity, I'll make it start at the origin. So it goes to the left by two units and then up six. Therefore, it starts here and ends up there. Similarly, for B vector here, tells me nothing about where it is starting from. So for simplicity, I'll make it start at the origin. And this vector goes to the, goes to the right six units. One, two, three, four, five, six, and goes down one unit. So it will start at the origin and end up here. Now, to add this, these two vectors, remember, one way to do that is what we have here is to put them, put the initial points together. And then what we do is we complete a parallelogram with, a, with two sides parallel to A and B. And then we draw from the common initial to the far corner of the parallelogram. Right, so that's the, there's the graphical way to interpret what we just did. Now we have the components. Adding them up is very easy to do. And the way it works is exactly as you would expect. You simply add up the x components, and then you add up the y components. So that's going to be a 4 and a 5. Okay, if I had drawn this a little bit better, then you, it, would, it would be exactly 4, 5. But of course, my, my freehand drawing is not perfect. But it puts us in the right direction. A little bit more to the, you know, to the right and then up a little bit. Any question on adding them this way? Borrow those two vectors again. <coughs> Minus two, six. And uh, six minus one. And adding them in component form is very, very convenient when you want to do stuff like, for example, negative A plus three B. With numbers, this is very easy to do. For negative a, that's what we have. This is negative a, and then 3b. When you multiply a vector by a scalar, you simply multiply each component by that same number. This would be positive 2, negative 6, plus 18, comma, negative 3. Okay, we multiply the numbers in, the number into each component, and then we add them up uh, 20 minus 9, like that. Look at this a vector again. So negative two, six. I'll just kind of roughly sketch it. Now, 
Now, how would you find out how long that vector is? Distance formula is, yep, exactly. One way, to, a helpful way to think about this is to look at this as a triangle, a right angle triangle, with uh, this side being six, and then this being two, right? And therefore, to find out the, the length of that vector, then we write the length of vector this way. We put a vector between the absolute value lines. So when you see this, this means finding the length or the magnitude of the vector. So that's pretty simple. Distance formula or the Pythagorean theorem, right? Six squared plus two squared. And this gives me 36 plus four, 40 radical 40. So in general, if A is equal to A1, A2, A3, and you want to find out how long that vector is, then you simply take the, the sum of the squares of each component add them together, and then you put them under a, a radical. Okay? Questions? Remember, the vector, the starting point of a vector is completely irrelevant. It doesn't matter where you start, because if you have the right vector, then the relationship between your starting and ending is always the same, regardless of where that vector is. So for simplicity, I put it on the origin, just so I could find out the, the length that way. But this vector could have been this one here, in that case, like you said, I needed to know where I started, where we ended, to find this more, per, uh, to find the length of each side. But again, keep in mind that a vector can start anywhere. Only the, the length and the direction matters. When you want to do stuff like that, just slap it anywhere that's convenient to, to calculate. Okay? Does that answer the question? Good. Other questions? Okay, so here's an example. I want you to work on this by yourself or with a friend. Now's a good time to talk to the guy or girl next to you and make a friend, or two. All right, so we got these two vectors. I want you to find these two things. Don't be shy. Make a friend. Okay. If you want to work on, work, work on this by yourself, that's fine. But feel free to work with uh, your neighbor.
OK, the first one should be pretty easy, right? So the magnitude of A alone is 1 squared plus 4 squared plus negative 2 squared, and all under square root. Radical 21, is that what you got? OK, good. How about the second one? Before we can find the magnitude of anything, we need to know what the vector looks like, right? So what, what is A minus B? Minus 2, minus 1, minus 1, minus 4, and 7, minus, minus 2, right? And then, oh. I did B minus A, didn't I? It's same thing, just the opposite. Excellent. So this is the negative of B minus. I, this is. So that's what I did, right? Is it clear what I, the mistake I made? Because I took B subtracting A, and I got this thing here. So this really is B minus A. But we're looking for A minus B. So an easy fix is I simply put a minus sign all the way through. So therefore, A minus B would look like positive 3, positive 5, and negative 9. Now in terms of the magnitude, does it matter? No. Absolutely not. Good. Because the magnitude is all of these guys squared, added together, which means the sign that they had to begin with is irrelevant. And this is what? 115, is that right? What? On quizzes, you just leave it like that. Don't do anything more to it. We, we trust that you can add these numbers together, but don't simplify this. Just leave it, because there's really not much more to do to it. Yeah. Is that a question you had for me? Yes? So we'll try to avoid having you calculate anything too big. You know, this, this might be something we, want, we, we can ask you to do on an exam. You can add these numbers in your head. We hope that you can do that. Um, but we're not going to ask you to try to factor this thing anymore, simplify too much further than what already is already there. So don't worry, don't worry too much about that, the fact that you, don't, you can't use a calculator on exams and quizzes will write exams and quizzes in such a way that you shouldn't need to use a calculator. Any question on this example? Yeah. Oh, good? Good? Okay. Other questions? Often you'll hear t people talk about something called a unit vector. A unit vector is a vector that has a length that's exactly one, one unit long. So for example, if I have this vector, um, A, the same A we saw earlier,
And what we would like to find here is a unit vector, a vector that has a length of one, that has the same direction as the vector A. The first thing you want to check when you see a question like that is exactly how long this vector is. And we found that in the last example, twen radical 21. That's uh, clearly not one, right? So the vector A is not a unit vector to begin with. This vector has a length of radical 21. And to make it a unit vector, all we have to do is to take this vector and divide it by its length. Then it'll have a length of one. So the vector A divided by the the magnitude of the vector is a unit vector that has the same direction as A. Dividing and multiplying by a constant doesn't change the direction. It changes the length of the vector. And when you do that, you simply divide each component by the same number, 1 over radical 21 and 4 over radical 21 and negative 2 over radical 21. So this vector here will keep the same direction as the, the original vector A, but this time the magnitude will be 1 as opposed to radical 21. Make sense? Yep. Let's add another layer of work to what we just did there. Let's find a vector that has the same direction as negative 2, 4, 4, but has a length of 5. Okay, this could be a trick question. This could be a length with a vector with length five to begin with. So let's find out how long it is. So that's going to give me thirty. 32 plus 4, that's 36. So it has a magnitude of 6. So this vector is 6 units long. We want, it to be, want, want a vector that has the same direction, but only 5 units long. So what we have to do, basically, is to make it a unit vector first. So we find a ve unit vector that has the same direction, so it's got a length of 1, right? And then multiply it by 5 to make it length of 5.
here's my vector. If I divide it by 6, then it gives me a a unit vector with the same direction. And now I want it five times as long, then I just multiply by five. So this vector right here will have exactly the same direction as this one, but it'll be five units long as opposed to six units long to begin with. Question? Like I said, it could be a trick question. If it started with a length of five, then you say the answer is right there. Okay. Other question? Okay, good. If you go into physics and engineering, you'll see three special unit vectors a lot. The vector I, the vector J, and the vector K Sometimes you even see, you'll even see the vector is written this way. Instead of an arrow over the top, you put this sign here. This usually, in, 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 in many applications, in many contexts, this means a unit vector with the name I. Okay, so you see stuff written like that a lot. IJK, I means a vector that goes to in the x direction by one unit, but not, nothing in the y direction and nothing in the z direction. So the vector I it looks something like that. It just stays parallel to the x axis. Doesn't have to stay on it, but it stays parallel to it. And this is what J might look like. And this is what K might look like. <coughs> so you got to get used to writing the components in this way and that way. Minus 2, 4, 5 could also be written as minus 2i because it has neg negative 2 times i, 4j, 4 times j, and then 5k. Here's the 5, and that's k. And like I said, in a lot of physical sciences, these vectors will be used very, very often. Okay, let's do one application problem using vectors. <coughs> Can 
airplane travels east. at a speed of 500 miles per hour. A 20 miles per hour wind from the south Blows the plane off course. To an observer standing on the ground, how fast and in what direction is the airplane traveling all right so the pilot thinks he's going east five miles per hour and then the wind from the south obviously takes the plane off course if you're standing on the ground tracking the airplane, we want to know how fast to, to the observer on the ground that thing is going and in what direction it is going. So we use vectors. Let, let's find a vector that represents the direction that this airplane is going. And I'll call that P. It's going east. So that's the x direction, right? 500 units, that's how fast it's going. And it's not going north or, e or south, so there's no y component for that. And then a 200, not 200, 20 miles per hour wind from the south, meaning it blows north, right? So maybe something like that. But it doesn't, doesn't change the x component of the vector, the airplane vector, but it changes the y component. And if you're standing on the ground, then what you're seeing is that the plane is actually traveling in the direction of this red vector with the magnitude of the red vector. When you add them up, that's what an observer on the ground is going to see. First, uh, first question, how fast is it going? That's pretty simple. That's simply the magnitude of the sum of these two vectors. Something like this would be unreasonable on a quiz and exam, and we will not do that, okay? And this is uh, a little bit over 500. So it doesn't change the apparent speed of the plane by that much. But what it does is change the direction. So it blew, off, blew the plane off course by this angle, theta. How would you find theta? Tangent, yep, very good. Tangent theta is the opposite 
over the uh, JSON. So that's also unreasonable to ask you to do on the on an exam. Unless you think it's reasonable. It's not. Okay, this is roughly um, 2.3 degrees. Therefore, to an observer on the ground, the plane is really traveling at 500.4 miles per hour. In a direction, we write it this way, it's heading mostly east, but it's east with a little bit of north. So we write east, 2.3 degree north, okay? So it's mostly east with a, about 2.3 degrees in the north direction. Questions? Yeah. Can you write what? Northeast would mean mostly north with a little bit of east. There's a difference in the, in the two, okay? All right, that's it for today. See you again Friday. Yeah.